Okay, so today we have, look at this, we have all these people here that are going to be talking about strategies that I sure want to hear when I'm working with international students, and I love your description, Mark Cola. The question you're going to get the panel, so I'll let you introduce them and go for it. Okay, great. Thank you, Olivia. You're welcome. All right, thank you everyone for coming to our panel discussion today. Um, so first of all, I'll introduce the uh, topic, and then we're each going to introduce ourselves and kind of talk a little bit about our professional positionality and how we approach our work with international students. Um, and then I'll ask the panel uh, some questions, facilitate a discussion. And uh, I would ask that you hold your questions until the end. There will be a time for questions at the end of the session, but uh, during the panel portion, just the panelists will be discussing and kind of building on the conversation. <clears throat> so the topic is international student engagement strategies. And uh, we're looking at the, this from uh, a curricular uh, perspective, engagement in the classroom. And uh, <clears throat> I've noticed um, in my uh, work with international students and reading uh, the literature about international student engagement that really the, um, <clears throat> the approach that, that is taken is um, international, stu international students are, are viewed uh, as having uh, deficits. Basically, uh, there's an over overwhelming amount of research on international students' need for help. and. and um, so students are, international students are viewed as uh, linguist, linguistically deficient, culturally deficient, academically deficient. And a lot of the literature out there is talking about how can we help them with their challenges. And I think that this, this sort of deficit view is problematic because it ignores the, um, all, of the, uh, <clears throat> you know, all of the aspects of the students' identities. That, um, for example, um, you know, they're, they're very intelligent, multilingual people. They have diverse cultural perspectives that they bring to the classroom. And just, just having a very narrow deficit uh, view of the student just really diminishes their identity and doesn't, um, you know, that's, so that's, that's problematic. And so this discussion is how can we move away from that sort of conversation into a more positive frame um, <clears throat> where we recognize uh, students as institutional assets that contribute to diversity and um, you know, institutional excellence. So that's the idea. <clears throat> so I'd like, yeah, now I'd like to introduce our, ourselves, kind of talk about our positionality. Um, I can go first. Uh, for me, I, uh, I studied abroad in Germany when I was a student, and I had a very positive experience. It was challenging learning the language, but everyone was very supportive to me, um, German friends and teachers. And people told me, you know, my, my uh, accent was sounded very sophisticated and we're very like, you know, so I had this very, <laughs> like, very nice experience. And then I came back and engaged more with international students on my campus and then through my work at St. Martin's. And uh, I noticed that especially international, international students of color have a very different experience. Um, <clears throat> a friend of mine who's Japanese, um, he, uh, you know his Japan, or his English is as good as my German, but uh, his experience is people told him that he his English was broken, and his English is not good, and so he kind of internalized that. Um, so <clears throat> I, there's definitely some uh, you know underlying ideology in the U.S. Uh, that's that's uh, that needs to be discussed and addressed. So. Um, I've worked at St. Martin's for eight years with international <coughs> students and I really learned a lot. I've had the privilege to hear a lot of students' stories and, um, <coughs> yeah, so, and basically a lot of, I've heard stories that are positive. I've also heard stories where students have encountered racism and um, all kinds of different scenarios. So, hostility. So, I've learned, I've learned a lot in my time at St. Martin's and so that's kind of how I how I approach my work uh, with international students, and um, yeah, and I recognize that as a, a white male, I have privilege <laughs> being in Germany and people telling me like my German's so wonderful. I mean, that you know, I, I recognize that that is a part of it. So, uh, hello everyone. I'm uh, John Hopkins, associate dean of students, director of uh, service and uh, diversity here at St. Martin's, and I've been here. Uh, over 10 years, going on 11 years. 
And uh, my work with international students is not direct. Uh, I spend most of my time uh, working on projects and programs that support students of color, um, LGBTQ students, uh, a few other uh, minoritized groups that, uh, that are here on campus. Uh, but in my uh, in teaching classes, I've had international students in my courses. Uh, and then every once in a while, an a international student will show up at uh, some of the programs that we do. So uh, in terms of uh, my actual work here with international students, it's sort of spotty and limited, uh, but have learned quite a bit from our students on what it, is, what it means to have an effective, inclusive uh, classroom space, and, uh, and then sort of thinking institutionally, what does St. Martin's need to be uh, to fully uh, embrace and be inclusive of international voices and students and their experiences? Uh, I'll say more about that as we, uh, as we go along, so. Uh, my name is Jamie Olson, and I am an English professor here at St. Martin's. Um, I thought, I thought Marco's introduction was really great, and, and uh, his, his mention of broken English, it, it just reminded me that it just so happens that this week I was teaching Amy Tan's essay, which is called Mother Tongue, where she talks about her, her mother's uh, brand of English, and she refers to her mother's English as impeccable broken English. <laughs> and I think, I think that, that idea can maybe be helpful, you know, if we think of our, of our students, even, even though they're, they're uh, they may be limited linguistically in ways that our uh, other students, domestic students, aren't. Uh, they still have ideas that we can help them to, to get to, to, to express. Um, and I think maybe that is, especially in my classroom as an English professor, I think that, that's part of my job. Um, so about what I, what I teach here that involves international students, just about every class I teach that, that involves international students, especially uh, at the, the first year first year writing classes as well as sophomore level literature courses and um, one of the things that we that we talked about as a panel with, as we were preparing for today was how some of our experiences have really helped us to feel empathy for the for the international students in our classroom and Marco already talked about his experience for me too as I've, I've studied in in Russia and I've studied in Russian uh, which is very humbling to 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 write in another language, to participate in classroom discussions in another language, and I think that that experience has really helped me to see how how difficult it is for international students. Okay, uh, my name is Angela McCaskill. I'm assistant professor of accounting, but I also teach in the business department. My doctorate degree is actually in international business. So it's kind of a misnomer when you see Professor of Accounting up here because I also teach international business class. Um, my experience is similar to these, uh, the other, to Marco and to Jamie, in that I studied abroad in France, and so I'm, I'm bilingual in French, doing my dissertation in France with interviews in French. So just as is Jamie is talking about, it's very humbling to be in an environment where I'm learning in a foreign language, and I'm trying to read and comprehend what I'm reading in a foreign language, which isn't always the easiest thing. And if you've had that experience, you will know firsthand what it's like to be in a classroom trying to take an exam, or even trying to read a text and not fully understand what you're reading. So I come from that background of, of um, having that experience in a foreign country and learning a language and, and including my students in the same kind of way in which I was included and would hope to be included. So that's, that's a little bit of my background. Hi, Lisa Bornasov. I am an assistant professor in civil engineering. Uh, I have a really low voice, so if you don't hear me, I'm sorry. I'm trying my best. Um, a point of empathy with international students, at least for me personally, is um, I didn't learn English, or how to speak English. Well, I was exposed to English in depth until I was seven. Didn't really try to learn until I was nine. So I kind of have that point of empathy where uh, trying to speak in, and communicate with people who are already way advanced and me and trying to catch up, that feeling of trying to catch up to other people, I think I can kind of relate to international students uh, pretty well with. Um, and yes. Great. So let's move on to the questions. I'm going to come back here. All right, so the first question is, uh, for everyone, what do you see as the greatest benefits of having international students in your classes? So 
whoever wants to start. Uh, for me, I think just um, exposing everybody to different perspectives, whether it's the domestic students or people who are coming in internationally, exposing other people to different types of people, I think it's always really helpful because it breaks us away from just expecting expecting just one ver version of the person that we have to interact with in the world. It makes you realize right away, hey, there are other people in the world that I have to interact with. I think that's really helpful for students. And adding to that, it's, um, it gives a different perspective for students in the U.S. who've never traveled outside of the country to really know, or at least to try to understand um, another person's perspective. And that can be really humbling um, as Americans. We have a lot of privilege that a lot of students don't have. And for some of you who may have participated in this week's activities, you've seen presentations from different students with backgrounds that were very shocking to some of my students. And to have that experience and exposure, I think, really adds to the classroom. Because I can only teach so much, but you can gain a lot of information from students who have first-hand experience. Yeah, just to echo what, what others have already said, I think uh, tapping into the experience that international students bring to the classroom um, can really enrich, enrich, enrich the, 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 the classroom for everyone. And I think a, a lot of what we'll probably end up saying today uh, is not only applicable to international students, right? It's about reaching students. And international students, uh, it's one group of students that we need to think about to reach. And um, they can often just bring really fascinating things to the classroom. I, I remember a few years ago I was teaching a poetry class and the students, I, I had one group that was doing a presentation on Ted Hughes's poetry. And uh, one, of, one of the students in the group was from China and he, he chose to focus on Ted Hughes's poem, which I think is called The Pike, uh, about a fish, the, the pike. And this Chinese student was a fisherman. So he, he did his part of the presentation by showing us videos uh, from China of, of, uh, of these really vicious pike. And, <laughs> and, um, and, it, and it, it enriched the experience of the poem for everyone, because we could see just you know, how <laughs> scary these fish are. <laughs> uh, I'm going to speak a little selfishly. Um, I'm transformed <laughs> as somebody who teaches and somebody who's up there um, sort of coming to the class with a set of ideas and knowledge and assigning text or, or working with students outside the class, uh, that I, I am transformed in the experience. The more that I relate to international students, uh, I have a very limited traveling history and, and so it's, and it's, at first it becomes a sort of curiosity. And then I'm, I'm very much aware of the fact that, um, that, that there, the student is presenting me an opportunity to show uh, where I'm limited in how I express myself, express my ideas, and the kinds of things that I have to do to change myself uh, to be more effective in teaching students, uh, teaching international students. Uh, and so I, and then just on a, on a personal, in a personal way, sort of walk away from, from the interaction sort of blown away that, um, that the student shared an aspect of him or herself um, that I have never considered. Uh, and uh, it's an opportunity for me, in addition to our students, learning uh, other perspectives as well. Thank you. How do you support international students' transition into U.S. academic culture? And what are the key characteristics of U.S. classrooms that international students need support attesting to? This is the fish question. Um, so in terms of inclusion within the classroom, I think you can go from very superficial trying to include people saying hi in the hallways, saying hi in the classrooms, to in depth. Um, one example of me trying to include other uh, international students in particular in classes was uh, in my pavement design class for their final. Uh, one of the extra credit problems were how do you say good evening in Brazilian, in Nigerian, and in uh, Arabic, because those were the three groups of students that were present in my class, which basically meant, I told the students this was gonna be a part of the extra credit. They had to talk to those people, right? Uh, so that's very superficial, just getting people to talk to them. I think that's one form of the uh, In terms of the actual classroom and me trying to facilitate learning in that sense, uh, one thing I try to do is make sure that my expectations are pretty clear uh, regarding what what I hope is the outcomes for their, their own learning, um, as well as the way I grade. So every 
I think for everybody in their syllabus, they give their breakdown of their grades, but for every single one of my assignments, I give a pretty detailed homework as well, so that it, I, it highlights exactly what I want, what my expectations are. That way, students who um, are unsure about the way I teach or how the American system works or whatever it may be, they have something that they can hold on to and, and study as well as kind of argue with their professor with the like this is my expectation or your expectations, how come you're creating it? So increasing transparency in that way I think is important. Um, I also give the students, uh, I tell the students that they also control the classroom as well, so it's not a power thing for me uh, when I uh, teach classes. Um, mostly because I'm not a very scary person, so me trying to exert power in front of people is kind of funny. Uh, but I think that's a change of a perspective for some students, right? The expectation is the, the teacher is the person that they have to listen to. They are the right person all the time. Um, when I tell them they have control over their grading, when we take tests, that type of thing as well, uh, I think it's a little bit of a change in perspective for some students, so I try to make sure that uh, they are welcome in participating in that as well. Um, another thing that I think is important is having redundancy in the way I teach. So as you guys can kind of tell, I have a little bit of a stutter. So if it's this bad in front of you, my peers, it gets even worse when, when I'm in front of uh, students. So I know that the way I speak sometimes, students may not learn from that right away. So I have to give them other options for trying to learn the material, right? So if that means aligning my lectures to textbooks so that they can read on their own, if that means providing my instructor's notes, my PDFs along with my written notes, then that's what it means as well. So trying to make sure that there's other options so that their downfall isn't just me. It's themselves too. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> also varied assessment methods as well. I know sometimes it's uncomfortable for people to speak in front of groups, especially when they have accents or if they, they can uh, produce their thought process in a specific language. So maybe instead of uh, presentation, there's also a component for writing as well. So I try to provide those opportunities within my classroom. Why is that important to vary assessment, to have different, different types of assessment? Um, I think because there are different learning styles, not just with international students, but with all students, I think. Uh, so trying to, the meat of, of teaching, I think, is students learning, right? If they're learning in a different way than um, what I was originally grading, does that mean they didn't learn? So being able to assess differently for the concept, their understanding of the concept, I think is important. Because if they can get that out of the class, then that, that we, at least somebody succeeds. So, <clears throat> what teaching practices have you implemented to make your pedagogy more inclusive and effective? Uh, equity at times <clears throat> requires offering specific accommodations to students who need them. In other words, fair treatment is not necessarily same treatment. What kind of supports or accommodations do you allow in order to help international students do their very best work without lowering academic standards? How do you ensure accommodations are fair and appropriate? Uh, this this question is one the one that I had agreed to take the lead on. But first, I want to step back and add something to to uh, the previous question because I was thinking as uh, as Lisa was talking about um, kind of group work with with uh, international students in, in in my in my classes. I don't know if others have had this experience too, but in my especially first year writing classes, when, when international students, they tend to come into to my class as a group. I mean, they register for the class as a group. Uh, so for whatever reason, maybe I've, I've gotten the rep reputation, undeserved or not, as being friendly to international students. I'll get you know a cohort of, of students from China all taking my class at once, or students from Brazil all taking my class at once. And then what happens when it comes time for discussion, I'll say, okay, now get into groups and talk to each other about this thing that we've read. Uh, they'll, if, I, if, I don't, if I don't put them into groups carefully, they'll just naturally, the Chinese students will all get into a group together, right? So uh, sometimes I let them do that. Um, I think sometimes that can be helpful, but, it, but in terms of acclimating <laughs> students to uh, American academic culture, I think it's also helpful to have them work with, with uh, American students sometimes, right? So, so I'll often force them into those, those groups, those mixed groups. Uh, but about this question, uh, accommodations, 
I, what I wanted to talk about is the way that I grade papers when I grade international students' papers. And I basically, I think about them a little differently than I do uh, student by, I think about those papers differently than I do papers by students who are native speakers. And essentially, I pay more attention to the ideas and less attention to the grammar. Um, uh, although, I would say that generally, there's been a kind of trajectory in my teaching where I'm paying more and more attention to the ideas, even with native speaking students. Uh, but with, with international students, this is definitely the case. I'm not going to mark them down on writing an ungrammatical sentence. Um, I will point out the ungrammatical sentence and help them to see it and, and try to show them how to improve it. But uh, I'm really grading them on their ideas, how they're presenting their arguments, how they're building the, the, the case that they're making in their paper. So that's one example of something that I do in my class. <coughs> I do exactly the same as him, and luckily I don't teach English, so I don't have to be as grammatically correct, I suppose. Um, with my accounting class, it's a little easier not to worry about that, because we're all about the numbers, right? So um, not, as, not as difficult, but with my international business class, I, I tend to have a gamut of students. A lot of work. And I also find that a lot of my international students, while well, they don't necessarily want to speak out, I've had a couple who would talk more than my, non, my, my native English speakers which I find surprising because they want to learn, but there's sometimes um, a little more difficulty for them to speak their language. When I look at papers, I do the same kind of thing. I, I look at content. I'm not so interested in, in grammar, which is good because I'm not an English major, um, but I do look and help them. How did you write a good sentence? What is grammatically correct? And I grade more on the content than, than the grammar. Uh, one last thing to add is I think providing opportunities for revision. So yeah. grading them super hard the first time, but also saying, don't worry, it's a safety net. You're able to give that those points back if you do this. I think it's important as well. Yeah. So I agree completely. It's, in, in my classes, I, I build in a lot of what I call low stakes assignments and no stakes assignments. <laughs> so you know, low stakes assignments are basically you do the work and, and, you, and you get uh, credit for it. Or, wait a second, maybe I'm mixing up my own terms here. A no-stakes assignment is one where you do the work and get credit for it, regardless of the quality. <coughs> and a low-stakes assignment is, are, are you know, sort of graded easier than, than major essays in the course, in my courses. How about in terms of accommodation for test taking and assessment? Um, should international students be allowed to have extra time on tests? Or um, if they didn't have time to complete a test, should they be allowed to retake it to demonstrate what they, what they know? This is kind of a complicated <coughs> question. So. This kind of goes into number four, so okay. I'm going to flip it yeah. over. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, this question is, um, yeah, what is the role of faculty in ensuring that international students have academic, linguistic, and social support, um, the support they need to be successful? Okay, so when I look at tests, and this is a good precursor, when I look at exams, <coughs> I, I look at it from, um, and an education person can, can totally back me up here, um, academic language is completely different than social language. And so when a student is reading an exam and trying to conceptualize and, and de decipher, decode, if you will, what the language is trying to communicate, they can't necessarily do that with academic language that they're not familiar with because they're not used to using big words we don't use normally in everyday speech. So when we're speaking, they can easily understand, but when they're reading something that's written academically, they have no clue. How are they supposed to decipher and decode a, a sentence, a question, if they can't understand and comprehend the text? So this goes back to education classes where you <coughs> look at how, how can you help a student do that? And one of the ways we can help an education student, or not an education <coughs> student do that, is by giving them more time and helping them to, to <coughs> take the time they need to understand the question so that they can at least answer it with semi-cohesion <coughs> and being able to understand what exactly they're being asked. So that's one of the things that I do, at least in my classroom, is give them that extra time. And I often get the pushback that it's not fair. Uh oh, I have a question mark. Right? We'll, we'll do questions at the end. So, it, yeah. It's not fair to my other students, but really, if you look at it, um, 
is it fair that they're looking at a language that isn't their own? So they're trying to decipher and decode a language that they don't know as well as my English speakers, <coughs> native English speakers. So for me, I don't look at fairness. Is it fair that they get extra time the others don't? Sure it is, because their language is in English. If they were given the same exam in their native language, they would have the same amount of time. I, sure, that would be that would be acceptable, but I don't know their native language. Um, so in order to accommodate that, I do give them extra time for what they need. So that's, that's one accommodation. Uh, I, I think that as far as who is required or whose job is it for students to be successful, it's a two-way street. The students need to learn and need to participate and the instructors can help them to become better and to help them succeed. So I think it, it's, it goes both ways. It's not just our job, it's also their job. Can I, can I concretize that? Yeah. So I, I just heard this two days ago. Um, a, a person who, who was an international student uh, shared the story of taking a test, and on the test was the word hillbilly. Oh, right. <laughs> I remember this. And, and, and this person said, um, I sat there for minutes trying to figure out what on earth hillbilly was. And, and, and the, as, as, you know, as you're sitting there contemplating this term hillbilly, um, minutes are going by, and everyone is sort of, right, and the stress starts to come up. And it just, I, I think it sort of makes us step back and understand what it is in our discipline that is fair, that is a standard, and be willing to, to sort of rethink what those are. Um, I'm not saying you blow the whole thing up in your discipline, but it is, you, you need to take, I, I, at least I do, take pause in, in sort of assuming what I expect all students to know, that maybe the way I'm writing this, or the words that I'm using, or the concepts, uh, present barriers that I don't intend, but I need to have a, well, I'll speak to this in my, in my question, a little bit more critical consciousness about, uh, about how I'm doing my work. Um, I would add, too, that I put into place multiple ways of, of examining. Um, and so sort of providing uh, other strategies, sort of the straight ahead test, or maybe it's a take home, maybe it's more paper writing, maybe it's other other means of trying to assess the way the wit in which students understand and grasp the material. Um, that's something that I did not do early on in teaching, but have figured out, at least in my areas, that that works pretty well. And it may not work in your discipline, but uh, from the social science perspective, it's, it's worked out for me. And I have to confess that I'm sort of, in this beginning of my, my teaching career, right, it's, it's hard for me to give up the idea of this is the hour that you guys do your, your engineering test. That's all everybody gets, unless you get the, the DDS letter, right? Then it's okay. Um, and I think I'm shifting to the more social consci consciousness thing. See that shift will happen within a year, right? Basically. <laughs> um, um, but yeah, it is hard for me to think about pragmatically if I'm giving these students extra time. What about the classes that are coming in afterwards? Where do I hold the test? All those things are coming going in through my head, but. Um, I think it is important to kind of take a pause and say, well, yeah, if I'm from their, from their perspective, when I was a kid, not understanding any English terms during the English test, right, I probably would have appreciated a little bit more time to try to soak it all in before I gave up, right? <laughs> um, but yeah. Yeah, I just want to also add, um, the International Programs Office is here as a resource for faculty as well. If you want to give a student extra time on a test, we don't have a testing center at St. Martin's, but you can always contact me. Um, I'm happy to proctor a test or arrange, help you arrange for that. Right, that's a good point because the, uh, uh, the disability services, it's not an option to, 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 give, to give a test down there unless the student has an accommodation that's, that's documented through that office. What about, um, I think some faculty are very strong, believe very strongly they should not give extra time, they should, to treat everyone equally, they shouldn't give extra time to international students, and they kind of equate that with a, basically a pity pass. How do you respond to that sort of? Um, I think it goes back to, would you be comfortable doing a test in a language that wasn't your own? Maybe you had a year in Spanish, could you take a, a test in whatever subject matter you're doing in Spanish? And I, I couldn't do that. Could I do it in French? I could, but I would need extra time to decipher some words. There's some words that maybe I don't know academically that I know <coughs> in a social context. So I would say, yeah, there is there is a, a need to, to give students in that situation an ability to succeed. And I don't think it's giving time for just sake of giving time and 
um, giving them extra things I would give my normal students, I'm, or my, my non-native English, my, my native English speakers, I'm giving them a chance to succeed in a language that isn't their own. And if it's giving them extra time, then that's what I'm going to do. I think a free, a free pass would be, would be some, something different. It would be more like, instead of doing the test in the classroom uh, like every other student, you can take the test home and use Google to answer it, right? I mean, uh, time, that just, I mean, it's just allowing someone a, a, little, a little more time to think, right? Um, so if you can build the time in somehow, it doesn't seem to me to be unreasonable. The question is how to do it practically. Uh, the way I don't give very many exams, but when I do, because I, you know, I give mostly papers, I sign mostly papers. But when I do give exams, I try to imagine, you know, what is the range of abilities uh, among the students in terms of how long it might take them to finish this test. So I try to basically design a test that will take a, a lot less time than. Than, than the classroom period, so that even someone who needs a lot of time will still have enough time to do it. So, what might you what might you recommend to faculty? Uh, <clears throat> ways in which instructors can build a classroom learning environment that affirms the identities of culturally, racially, and linguistically diverse students. Okay, so that one's mine, and I completely missed the slide. This was my slide. I didn't realize that. So this is good. So catch me if I don't talk about this. Okay. Um, so I, um, I think it's still relevant though. So the, 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 the approach that I take with, with any diverse group that we're working with uh, is uh, that as faculty, as staff, we have to become critical of the learning environment itself. And let me just share what I mean by this. That, that we, we begin with an understanding of ourselves as faculty and staff as we enter the classroom. We are bringing with us a background set of assumptions, preconceptions, beliefs that clearly influence the way we teach, how we understand our discipline, how we work with our students. Uh, to, to, to not take that approach is to sort of assume that the class is neutral around questions of identity. So, so a lot of the work around critical uh, race studies or critical consciousness studies sort of thinks about what is it that I'm bringing to the class. In terms of international students, I mean, here's an example. So if I come into the class thinking that all students need to assimilate into the cultural norms of this class or this institution in order to be successful, right? So what we're asking our students to do at that point, without articulating it, we just assume that's the case, that, that we bracket the person's identity and their experience that it makes no difference in the classroom. And that sort of goes against our first question, which I, um, just, I think all of us were talking about the benefit of when students come into our classrooms and what they share with us. Uh, so so it, it is waking up to the way that our teaching strategies, our curriculum, the text that we assign, all of it is, is a reflection of how we understand our discipline, how we understand ourselves. And on, in the background is this whole uh, socialization that, our, that we undergo in our society around issues of race, class, gender, the way we understand people that are way over there, thousands of miles away, um, our belief systems in our media that inform our perceptions of other, um, other cultures and groups. Becoming aware of that is the first step, I think, in sort of thinking about um, the recognition of affirming uh, identity. I think also um, is sort of looking at the way in which um, making space <coughs> in the curriculum and in the discussion where the identities of students come forward, right? So this becomes relevant, that they're speaking from their location. And, and so re recognizing where that is coming up and where, uh, where in the classroom this needs to be, um, needs to be uh, forward, we need to talk, we need to, it's not necessarily an issue, it's sort of just making a, a space for students to interact in a way, or you're interacting with the students in a way that their identity becomes relevant. It becomes informative of how they're trying to explain the text or explain the ideas. Uh, let me give you an example. So a couple of years ago, I was teaching an introduction to social justice class, and this happened a few years after the Arab Spring. I want to say that was 2011, right? Arab Spring 2011. So I want to say 2013, I had a Saudi student um, in the class. And this class goes on, I sort of, the way I begin is sort of doing this philosophical analysis of the question of justice, right? I start focusing on uh, you know, red power movement and the women's movement and Chicana civil rights. And, and this student had no clue what I was talking about. This is not his experience at all, right? So he was really struggling. After a couple of weeks, he comes to me 
And as we're talking, he starts to draw from his own experience. And he says, I just, I'm so excited about the Arab Spring. And I said, well, tell me about the Arab Spring. What, what's going on for you as you're sort of watching the news? And he starts talking about his sisters, his aunts, his mother. They're getting driver's license for the first time. Right? And I said, okay, so we just did a unit on sexism. Okay, so we're talking about the U.S. context. Do you see points of intersection between your experience and the concepts that we're talking about in the class? Right, right there, this the smile comes on his face. He's starting to see uh, the connections there. And I only have the assignment. The, the way I structure the class is we're only going to talk about the U.S. context. I blew that up for the student. If you want to talk about your own experience, write a paper on what you're passionate about. And he writes this amazing paper. Again, back to the first question. I completely was blown away by his story. And the way that he was thinking, I mean, he was thinking about quitting school and going back and being an activist uh, in his community. I mean, that's, I'm thinking, okay, well, you know, great. Uh, but before you go, let's think through a lot of stuff, right? Um, but it's that, it's that kind of, right? So if I, if I say, no, student, I'm sorry, you have to assimilate into my classroom. And for you to be successful, you have to understand the concepts that as the, in the way that I'm expecting you to understand them. I lose a connection with him. I lose that opportunity to learn from him or to allow him to speak from that, uh, that very passionate uh, position that he had. So anyway. Thank you, John. All right. <clears throat> I think in the interest of time, I'd like to open it up for questions. Yeah. I've got two questions, kind, kind of. First off, I'm kind of curious as to why the biology program has such a dramatically underrepresented number of international students. I mean. A lot of the leading minds in current medicine and ancient medicine come from other cultures, especially the um, other side of the Pacific Rim. And here I am teaching about Shen Nong to a bunch of Caucasian males and females, uh, teaching about um, Ayurvedic medicine to a bunch of <coughs> Caucasians, teaching about Miswak to a bunch of Caucasians, and they're like, yeah, yeah, but it's a common pill form. And I think we, we don't have that diversity, and I'm wondering, why don't we have any we have like one or two maybe international students in the um, bi in the bio program, or maybe I'm just missing them somehow. They just don't take my classes, but. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't speak fast, so maybe that's why. <laughs> maybe, maybe I can explain that. I mean, uh, that has something to do with when we recruit our international mm -hmm. students. Because right now, the majority of our international students, they're sent by government. And uh, they're sent by the Saudi Arabian government and the government wants them to study engineering. So if you go to engineering, you see a lot of Saudi Arabian okay. students. And then students from other countries, because we also have joint programs, but a lot of them have business programs, so transfer programs, so they come in as third year. But it's changing. Now we are recruiting high school graduates. And um, a lot of them are still in our ESL program. And we expect next year they will matriculate to the new program and some of them will be inevitable. So basically they're not coming for the bio program because we have oh, a crappy yeah. bio program compared to you, Doug. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Actually, like, I gave a campus tour to a student from India. Um, I gave a campus tour to a student from India who's interested in biology. And I know uh, St. Martin's is kind of, um, you know, I'm always going to India in the spring. I'm going to be going to India as well. So We have no one with a perspective on Ayurvedic medicine. We could use that. <laughs> <laughs> well, to answer, help answer that question also, uh, in the most, a lot of students that go major in biology, they're doing it because they want to take pre-med, right? Yes. We have Nobody a lot is going to come from outside that wants to do medicine, come here. Why? Because medicine in the other countries, you go straight from high school, you can already take medicine. Here, you gotta take pre-med four years and then go into medicine. So it's very, it's gonna be very rare that somebody's gonna take medicine. Well, interesting. The second question I had was for that extra time thing, because in, two, in, in one hour and 20 minutes, I'm gonna have a student who barely speaks English at all. I've been told, cannot have extra time because She's not international, she's here native, but she's first generation, speaks fluent Spanish, wonderful Spanish, almost no English. But I mean, do we have a, do we, the, the, the testing center has told me, no, they cannot have extra time. Yeah, so first of all, we yeah. don't have a testing center. We, I mean, we have disability support. Yeah, yeah. And so they only provide disability support. 
So if a, I think if a faculty member wants to offer extra time, that, that would be... I'm going against policy, and I shouldn't be doing that. No, no, you're not no it's not going against policy. It's just that the disability center cannot offer that extra time. You'd have to come to, you know, talk to me or someone else to help to provide that space to proctor the exam. Or you could, or you could do it yourself. Yeah. But it wouldn't be against policy. It's not. It's not a barrier for a professor to say you get extra time, but the rest of you don't. I don't think so. I mean, some people prefer to offer it to any student who, like, uh, some students read more more slowly than other students and would that, like extra time as well. So that so could be half of my students then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, Biology is hard. Uh, <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, so to address you from a. A, a parallel this one anyways um, so my solution to that I, I started where you were Lisa um, with the I have 50 minutes for this exam and everybody's getting it and, it's, and then after thinking about it for a while I decided that my strategy was not as much about whether or not they could do it in 50 minutes although that is a you know that is also a reasonable metric if you want that to be important um, but that that I wanted more to give my students the opportunity to show me what they could do rather than be limited by something. And so um, I decided to go ahead and offer extra time to all of my students if they wish it. But I was also mentored in my first year of teaching that I should write an exam that I could do in 10 to 15 yeah. minutes, and that that would be an appropriate length for most students. And so usually I only have a handful of people who take extra time. Not last time, but. <laughs> Something else going on. <laughs> but usually that's the case, and then um, I just take them down to the lab room, and you know we take a few extra minutes if they need it. Okay, that might save so that might save that might save a student's grade in about an hour and twenty minutes. Mm -hmm. Rob, something I used to do is, um, as a high school teacher, and I haven't had the need to do it in college yet. But some of the things that I've done is given them a slightly modified test. To, um, so it's so it's still and what you're doing is you're still asking them to do the same amount of work, but the workload for them because of the language is much harder. And so what I would do for some students is I would strike out like every third question. And so they're not as answering as many questions, but they're still doing the same work. And then what I would do with the score is I would scale it up proportionately. Um, I, 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 similar idea, except um, I was giving an exam to Chinese students. <coughs> so I was uh, teaching in China last summer and giving an exam to Chinese students. So my exam questions were designed for American students, like native English speakers, and inevitably my students didn't have a clue what these words meant. So I had to go back and change words on the exam to fit what they might know. Instead of um, extreme, it might be big, large. Some words, instead of one big word that I might know in English, um, give it a synonym for the word, but in an everyday common language. That seemed to really help, because once I did that, the students understood the question and they could answer the question better. So sometimes it's just a matter of modifying an exam, not necessarily, I don't know, taking out questions, which sometimes works, but modifying it to make it language that a student would be able to understand. One thing uh, that I've done that I think is effective is to uh, release Part of the exam ahead of time so that students can think about it and prepare it. So if I have a three-part exam and maybe there's some short answer questions and a quotation identification question and then an essay question, I will release the essay question ahead of time and then those who need to think through it um, or want to think through it can feel more comfortable that they have something prepared. They don't write it out and bring it in, but they have ideas that they then bring to the exam. And that's I think that's a great idea, and that's I, I, I've been doing that for a few years now too. And I, I got the idea from Brian Barnes, which he does I think for all of his exams. And as, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, with them too. That's right. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's really great for students to be able to to think through the argument ahead of time, so they're not trying to do it you know on the fly in the classroom. On on, on another level too, right, that helps them with the other parts of the exam as well, because they, then they have a chance to kind of look at <coughs> concepts and vocabulary. Study. If there's that. <laughs> uh, I think that uh, according to evaluation experts that I've read, all evaluation methods are flawed. So what's important is to give a diverse set of evaluation so that you have several methods, and that way you don't have to do special treatment towards 
uh, disability or, or international, if you find that they know the subject more than you do, you know, regardless if their average is 70, you, you have the right to bump it up to an eight uh, if, they, if they prove that they really know the subject well. And that you can do for any student, so you wouldn't be giving a favor. I mean, I found that with a, with a disability student that he knew the subject so well, but he wasn't able to get uh, one specific type of exam. And I know that I'm conscious that all my exams are flawed. Uh, so if you give a diverse, I know that international students, they typically don't do good in multiple choice because the, the language from one answer to another is very close. Yeah. But maybe that's a flaw that I have to fix for all my students, not give, uh, not put too much emphasis on multiple choice. Um, so the, the other thing that I noticed like is the examples. Like if you're teaching with an example that they're familiar with, they it's incredible how they learn more. And okay, like if you had in Brazil, you had streets, uh, people from the slums compared with regular schools learning math. When it money, the people from the slums did better. Any other examples, they did worse. There's research in math, the supermarket, that housewives can do math at supermarket better than other uh, <laughs> people because the example. So I guess if, when I was went to teach in Dubai, they they were teaching American football database with an American football example that wasn't appropriate. When we switched to soccer, it, they it went way up the learning. So I mean that, that's my uh, international experience. That's that's a really good point, and, and and actually that gets to the question that we cut. I think yeah, the very last question. Yes, yeah, yeah, I, I just wanted to reemphasize. Oh, yeah. You didn't mention that, but I wanted to reemphasize yeah. the the diverse uh, a lot of. What's on the screen? Yeah, just the uh, yeah, so we didn't talk about pop culture. One of the things that, that can alienate international students are pop culture references that, that uh, American students get, but they don't. So I mean, I think you're right, just being careful to think about what are the examples that you're including. And, and you know, like, like John says, think about what they, um, how they exclude people. Uh, from time to time, I think it's useful to give an oral exam. Um, I know it's time consuming, but you'll, um, I do that in my classes because law has an oral tradition. So um, I find that um, you just find out a lot more about your student um, giving that. And um, it's the problem is it's time consuming, but if you do from time to time, you'll realize that your international student or a student with a disability actually knows <coughs> more than the other students do. It's just that the delivery is the issue. I just want to also um, just uh, pause a second too, like, because um, we're discussing international students with, uh, in the same context as students with disabilities. So this is all, like just the language we use. I mean, kind of contributes to this deficit mind mindset of how we think about international students. So that's something that I'd like to try and you know counteract. examples available to the writing center um, are the are the students who are assisting these students and we have a lot of international students I think um, going to the writing center for peer review of their papers are are the tutors um, and maybe you can't answer this question are the tutors being trained specifically to assist international populations or are they being trained to work with the basic writers, which are totally two different issues? Um, yeah, I can't speak on behalf of the training that they're receiving at the Writing Center. Um, in the past, I've been invited to do some trainings for uh, peer readers, but I think that I haven't done that in a couple of years now. And is this something that the international programs are they're interested in doing, and is maybe having their own their own support or? Um, the students are, I'm just wondering how they're being supported once they're, they're um, coming into our classes beyond the fourth floor. Yeah, um, so I think the St. Martin's model is we have a, an ESL program, and once they finish ESL, um, there isn't a lot of support beyond what is available to all students. So um, there's not much equity in that, I guess. I mean, 
So we do, our office, we, we provide, we can provide tutoring and additional support to students who need it, but sometimes uh, a lot of students will slip through the cracks because, uh, you know, we reached out and they didn't respond or, um, you know, for whatever reason. So, uh, yeah, I mean, that's a good question. I mean, <clears throat> just as an institution, I mean, what more can we do to support students? I mean, at, at all levels, um, you know, faculty and international programs office, learning and writing center, advising, all these areas. Right. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> uh, students from foreign countries like uh, China, Korea, or India, they are not accustomed to like uh, homeworks every week. Uh, a lot of them, they usually have uh, one or two exams per semester, that's it, that's it, they get the grade. And <clears throat> so some of them really uh, have a uh, trouble uh, getting more has to finish homeworks uh, every week or every <coughs> and and then uh, also uh, so some of the students from particular country uh, they all ask somehow disability service mm -hmm. oh. so yeah all of them and I mean, I have a trouble of uh, giving them all of them that uh, 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 the permit to take a exam twice of the times and then no um, disruption mm -hmm. kind of an environment. Yeah, so I think, um, I mean, that kind of speaks to St. Martin's current model. Uh, you have to have a disability to get uh, extra time on tests in the, in the uh, Learning and Writing Center. So that leads a lot of international students um, to go to a doctor to get labeled as having a disability in order to get accommodation. To me, that's um, you know that's pretty problematic. <laughs> and then there have been scenarios where uh, you know students uh, have produced letters from saying they have anxiety or something from a doctor in a different country, and then people question the authenticity of such documents. And so just the whole thing is problematic. <laughs> Is that happening, Marco? Yes. Yeah. Are, are, oh, are international students yeah. actually bringing disability to get accommodation? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's it. Yeah. A lot of international students. Yeah. Marco, I wonder if you can help me understand a little bit, and it might have to do with treating international students as disabilities, because I find it, especially with Asian students, and this has been my experience over years, is I ask them their name. And they come out with this American name, like, you know, Angela or something. And I say, is that really your name? No, that's my American name. So I say, well, could you tell me your name? And I could try to pronounce it, and, and I do the best I can. And they seem to appreciate that. And I wonder where in the system, is it before the Asian student comes to our country, where they're told you need an American name because the Americans can't pronounce your name? Or are they told that when they get into our system? And how we might be able to better um, respect them and honor them as individuals with the name they've been given and does that might have anything to do with immediately they're told they have to change their name because we can't well we could try so i just wonder if you know where that happens or how we might be able to help with that yeah <clears throat> well, that's yeah that's uh, kind of a complicated question i think for a lot of reasons uh in some in some countries students don't use their first names so much it's kind of an intimate thing they go by their last name and then but in the u.s everyone calls them by the first by their first name which is kind of strange to them so then they might feel more comfortable just having a, an american name or um, so that's part of the time some students uh have told me you know they tried using their their actual name but no one remembered it and they just nobody ever knew their name they just felt invisible so they decided to choose a more english sounding name so people could remember their name actually so um, so there are a lot of reasons. Blaine, did you want to add to that? Well, yeah, um, I think there's also a cultural element to it in, in the sense that um, in all the cultures that I've worked with, the, the, the students who most consistently and almost always, I would say 90% of the time, uh, change their name are Chinese students because mm -hmm. it's very, very hard for uh, people to pronounce them and remember them. And they just feel comfortable with um, you know, using an English name. And they, you often get them in China before they come here. So they, they introduce themselves as Angela or Candace or one thing or another. <coughs> and sometimes Koreans do the same.
but I've never had a Japanese student do that. And I've never had any Latin American, any Spanish speaking students do it. It's, it's really only certain cultures that do it. And I don't know if it's a tradition, it's become a tradition or something, but it definitely has something to do with the difficulty of pronouncing the names. So. I wouldn't, I wouldn't encourage them to not change their name. I think that's a good policy for them to change their name. I notice in different countries abroad, and especially developing countries, there's a lot of discrimination by the name. And with our, our new president, we may move towards that uh, <laughs> direction. So I would, for them to get a job, I mean, they, here they're not going to be discriminated, but if they want to stay here and want, they want to get a job here, it's probably better to have a, an English name, I think. I, I also try to. It, 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 it is better is. abroad. It is better abroad. It makes a difference. Here is less discrimination than most countries, by far. But, uh, uh, but we may be moving in, in that uh, direction also. And it, it, is, it is good to, to have an English name. That's my opinion it's from working abroad. I agree with that, but for slightly different reasons. Um, the name called, comes with a lot of baggage. And it, sometimes it works in the other culture. Sometimes it works better. Sometimes it doesn't. Um, and I come from, I have personal experience living in another culture, changing my name for the duration of my stay, not legally. Just because my name had some baggage, I, wouldn't, I wasn't sure what it was, but it just doesn't, didn't work in that language, in that culture. And so I changed it to one that was very common, that was my middle name, already. And I found, I don't, I'm not sure if the other name would have been a problem, but I found it empowering and sort of like, not, not necessarily, necessarily selling out, but it just felt like there was a different aspect of me that was coming out. So I think it's a positive thing. I do. I wonder. If, I wonder if what we can do is simply ask, "What name are you most comfortable with?" Yeah, and then just going with whatever they give us. That's what I mean. Yeah, I would. I would echo that. Yeah, I mean, it's a, ha having the students have have the autonomy to to share with us what that is. And I'm speaking from experience, where where two international students came to me in tears because they have to explain to to Americans. Uh, their name over and over again, and and that they were assigned. They didn't explain how an American name. Uh, it, it was an undignified experience, and so sort of listening to the students and seeing, you know, what 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 their particular view is and how they how they want to present is is really important to get their voice, as opposed to policy or anything like that. That's be problematic. Yeah. For example, in my level four class, um, I have. Uh, like three Chinese students, and two of them have two of them want to be called by their English name, but the one of one of them prefers the Chinese name. Her name is Yu Ting, and you just say Yu Ting. You know, you don't say Catherine or Candace, and so you just refer to them by what they prefer. And so I always defer to what they prefer, and many times they prefer the English name. That's what they want to go with. Well, I've had students say, "My name is Brad Pitt." <laughs> <laughs> I think it applies in this culture too. Just listen to the Johnny Cash song. Yeah, Boy Name Sue. Sue. <laughs> it's the same issue. <laughs> we did have we did have um, a male student um, in the early 2000s whose name was Rose. So I mean, I'll just throw that in a little bit. Wait, was this an international student? Or? Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, Sue was not in the national school. I think that's just another question. Uh, I know uh, there is some potential process for uh, graded, uh, foreign graded students. But do you have any uh, screening or potential process for undergraduate foreign students? Or is it difficult to have that? Uh, can you, sorry, I'm not sure if I understood screening process. What do you mean? Well, wow, admission process. Admission. Oh. Yeah, the GPA has to do something. Well, they have a TOEFL. Yeah. Yeah, we have. Um, yeah, we. I mean, we. We have a. In our office, we have an international admissions committee that reviews uh, students' applications, their their uh, high school GPA, their um, TOEFL test score, uh, just the same as any other applicant. They have to be admissible to the university, the same standards as anyone else. So it's, I think it's after the clock now, so uh, thank, thank you very you so much, much for coming. Yeah.